All right, thanks for joining me on my final video of Holy Week as we do a Bible study on the resurrection. Today we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians 15, which is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. I'm going to be picking out various passages because this is a long chapter. So we'll begin by looking at verses 3 through 10. I'll start by reading this section. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all of the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. Paul begins this section by saying, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. Look at this language of delivered and received here. What follows is a creed that Paul is inserting into his letter to the Corinthians. The creed ends with verse 7. In 3 through 5, we find four that's which begin a new claim of the creed. Notice how the first and the third lines end with this phrase in accordance with the scriptures here and here. So what's the meat here? Well, it's that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, he was raised on the third day, and he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. To really boil it down, we've got Christ's death, burial, resurrection, and multiple appearances. If you're not aware, Cephas is a reference to Peter, and in this creed, Paul only mentions two people by name, Peter and James. The James mentioned here is not a reference to the disciple John's brother. Rather, it's a reference to the younger brother of Jesus, James, who is the head of the Jerusalem church. He really is the pastor of the first church of planet Earth, and he's very prominent in the early church. If you read the book of Acts, we find a lot of information about James. He's also the author of the book of James in the New Testament, and he presides over the first church council in Acts chapter 15, in which Paul and Peter are in attendance. You might remember from the Gospels that Jesus' family did not believe in him. They were not his disciples. Um, in fact, if you read in both Mark and John, I believe, both mention that his brothers did not think that Jesus was who he says he was. And only when you get to Acts chapter 1 do we find Jesus' family, mother and siblings, present with the disciples in the upper room, and they actually end up praying to Jesus in that passage. So what changed their mind? You guessed it, resurrection and appearances. In fact, it's only in this creed that we find that Jesus went and visited James. We don't have that recorded in the Gospels. Nonetheless, the specific reference to Peter and to James in this creed has actually led scholars to date this creed to his early believe it or not, to AD 35, maybe even earlier than that. Why is that? Well, check out Galatians chapter 1. In Galatians 1, Paul shares part of his testimony and says in verse 16 that God was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who are apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Verse 18. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. So Paul specifically mentions visiting with Cephas or Peter and James in this early visit after his conversion. Going back to verse 3, it's remarkable how the text says that Christ died for our sins. What this means is that Jesus' followers immediately recognized his crucifixion as being an atonement for sins, since his death was for our sins. The reference in verse 6 to Jesus' appearance to more than 500 brothers at one time, it's hard to recognize when this occurred. Perhaps it was at his ascension. Um, that could have been a larger crowd if you check out the end of Matthew 28. Paul is daring the Corinthians to check out the witnesses, since he says most of whom are still alive, and then he uses this euphemism for death, though some have fallen asleep. Paul adds in verse 8, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God, but by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. Next, I want to turn to 1 Corinthians 15, 12 to 20, only because you don't find this kind of honesty in other religious texts. Paul is in essence saying that Christianity is true because Jesus rose from the dead. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, our faith is false. I'll begin by reading it. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, 
How can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Apparently there is some teaching in the Corinthian church which is denying the final resurrection of the dead at the end of days. We can see this when, with Paul's statement, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Paul's theology of both Christ's resurrection and the final resurrection of the dead can be seen here in verse 13 when he says, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. So what we can understand is that Paul viewed both both resurrections to be inextricably tied together. So if Christ was raised from the dead, then that means we will have a final resurrection of the dead. If we have a final resurrection of the dead, then that means Christ was risen from the dead. If you have one, you have both. If you don't have one, you have neither. And then he gets to the implications of Christ not being raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. And then he gets real blunt of the implications of this when he says, then those who have fallen asleep or died in Christ have perished and this is the strong sense of perished, namely being separated from God. Why are they separated from God? Well, because they are still in your sins. And he admits in verse 19, this is what I mean by you don't find this kind of honesty in other religions when he says, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. So Paul is contemplating the implications of Jesus not being raised from the dead. And once he's done so, he goes ahead and speaks the truth, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. In this language, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, Jesus' resurrection was the first, but the final resurrection of those who are in Christ will follow. In verses 42 to 47, Paul states, So is it with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown in natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus, it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. Some of the content in this passage is similar to Paul's teaching in Romans chapter 5. Paul is obviously talking about both our physical body and our spiritual body. This is why he says what is sown is perishable, a reference to our natural body. Further statements on the natural body are it is sown in dishonor, it is sown in weakness, it is sown in natural body. He makes the statement if there is a natural body, and then the spiritual body follows. What is raised is imperishable. It is raised in glory. It is raised in power. It is raised in a spiritual body and there is also a spiritual body. So there's a reference to our natural or physical body and a reference to our spiritual resurrected bodies. He takes it further by talking about the curse and redemption. So we've got the first man, Adam, being spoken of here, and the last Adam is a reference to Jesus, which is once again one of the subjects he covers in Romans 5. The first man, Adam, was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven, of course, referring to Christ. I love this statement in verse 49. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, of course, we are made in God's image as a man. Genesis 127, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. But those who are in Christ, we also bear the image of the man of heaven. Listen to Romans 8:29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So in this passage, predestination is referring to our being conformed to the image of the son. That is a a part of our sanctification. God predetermined or predestined that an aspect of our salvation would be that we are conformed to the image of Christ. And this is a process, something that takes place over our entire lives. This is what it means to mature in your faith or be discipled in your faith or being sanctified in your faith. You're being conformed to the image of the Son. Finally, in verses 54 to 58, Paul states, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, 
death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. So a real encouraging ending to this chapter, when the perishable puts on the imperishable. So that's when we die and we are raised into spiritual bodies. The mortal will put on immortality. And then a victory cry and a mockery of death. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sing? And of course, we thank God. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And because of all that is above this, Paul states, therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. This is our encouraging takeaway from the preceding 57 verses. I'll read it again. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. How encouraging. Indeed, what 57 says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ.